For our sermon this morning, if you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we will be primarily in verses 7 through 11 of Matthew 7 this morning. A little over a week ago, I came across a sermon clip on Facebook um, that intrigued me, and I've never seen this preacher before, but I was able to find it on YouTube, and, and I watched the sermon. It's not untypical. I know you think I love to just stand up here and preach, but I actually enjoy listening to sermons, and, and so I found this guy on YouTube. What's interesting is, is the very next day, Neil Wondercheck, who has never texted me a sermon before that texted me, and this sermon's been on YouTube for a year, so it's not like it just came on, and said, hey, I just watched a sermon. I think you'd be interested in this sermon. And I'm, well, I just watched this last night, Neil. The next day, I texted it to another friend of mine back in Wisconsin, and he said, it's on Thursday. I watched it on Tuesday, but he texted me back and said, I just watched it on Tuesday. I was going to send it over to you because I thought you'd be interested. So God has placed this sermon in front of me uh, to consider, and, and I believe that. God intended for me to just focus on this sermon, and I, and I have it, and, and it's been instructive for me. The sermon is titled, if you would like to watch it, it's on preaching, which obviously is a great topic I love to talk about, but the title is The Use of the Words of God in Preaching, and, and it's by a man named Richard Owen Roberts. Never heard of Richard Owen Roberts before this, um, but he's been around. He's, I think now he's 92. I think when he preached the sermon, he was probably around 90. But don't let that fool you. This man is a fiery, wiry preacher, um, wandering the platform, getting down on the floor, and to the point where the cameraman is losing him, um, and, and so the cameraman can't even see him speaking. It's, he's a very interesting preacher. And again, the focus was on preaching, and he tells a story in that sermon of a friend and businessman that he had. He, he dealt in books, and he would buy books from this businessman over in Europe, but this businessman came to America, and he said his purpose for his visit to America was to go listen to the great preachers in America. He wanted to hear the great preaching of America, and he had an itinerary laid out where he was going to go and listen to the preachers around the country of America. And a few weeks after he returned, Richard Robert, or Richard, he's got too many first names, Richard Owen Roberts uh, went and visited him, went to purchase more books and do some business with him, and they had dinner together. And he looked at this man, he says, hey, look, tell me about your trip. How did it go? I mean, how did, how, how, how did you find the preachers in America? And this man, I think if I remember right, he, he, he said he balled up his fist, a very large fist, and he walloped the table and he said, I didn't hear a single sermon in America. And Roberts responded, he said, well, were you taken ill? Were you unable to fulfill your itinerary? And the man replied, no. He said, you don't have any preachers in America. All you got are teachers. And so Roberts, naively, he says, asked, well, in your mind, what is the difference between teaching and preaching? To which this man again walled up his fist and wall up the table again. And he said, it is not a matter of my opinion. It is an established fact. Teaching is to inform. Preaching is to move. I believe that. I believe that. Now, I believe to move you, I need to inform you. I need to teach you. And and so there is that aspect. We, we should not just be pounding people and moving them and manipulating them. We should be informing them, but inform them for the purpose of them moving. He said, ultimately, he said, the preacher knows the people are here, but they also know they don't belong here. They belong over here. And so the preacher comes, and knowing that they're here, his job in the sermon is to move them from here to where they belong, over here. I believe that. I believe that is preaching. And the greatest preacher who ever lived is not standing before you this morning. <laughs> it is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. And this is the greatest sermon ever preached that we find in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And Jesus says, I have preached his teaching over the last 
nine months or so on righteousness. And, but Jesus primarily has been teaching on righteousness. But he's not done. As we come to our text this morning, now he is getting ready to inform his audience, I find you here, but you need to be over here. He has taught us what righteousness is. And we have come to the conclusion, I hope, that we aren't righteous. And he is, his intention in this text is to take them from unrighteous to righteous. And that's what we find here this morning in Matthew chapter 7. In verses 7 through 11, he's beginning to kind of close out the body of his sermon and coming to his conclusion. And here's what we read. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you? When his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? Father, we just desire this morning that you would move us by the power of your Holy Spirit as your word goes forth, and I pray it is your word that goes forth, that you would send it forth and move us, transform us and change us by the work of your Holy Spirit and giving us understanding and wisdom and how to live it out. By the grace of Jesus Christ, and in his name we pray, amen. Again, in the last 10 months, we've been talking about righteousness. Jesus has been teaching us on righteousness, and I know we've done this many times before, but it bears repeating again. Go back to chapter 5. Chapter 5, and as he introduces the primary body of his sermon, because he begins that in verse 21, we ended that last week, but the the statement he makes before he gets into the body of his sermon is found in Matthew 5, verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees, the scribes, they had lowered the bar. Remember that? They had taken the standard that God has in the law and the prophets, the standard of righteousness, and they chipped away at it and brought it down to a place where they said, I think I can get over that bar. And so if I can get over that bar, then I will be considered to be righteous. And Jesus comes with this sermon and he says, no, the bar is the law and the prophets. The bar is the Old Testament. The standard of righteousness is immovable. And I come to declare to you that your righteousness must exceed their lower bars. Your righteousness must go past even the righteousness revealed in the Old Testament. That's the standard you must get over, that standard of righteousness. And he goes on in the body of his sermon to teach what that standard is. And so we talked about murder. And all of us say, oh, a law that I can say I have lived with. I've never killed anybody. And then he says, wait a minute. You ever been angry at your brother? You ever called your brother a name? You're guilty of the same thing. Ooh, okay, I'm guilty of murder. And then if you miss on that one, you don't think so, he goes to adultery. You ever lusted with someone, for someone in your mind who wasn't your spouse? He says, you're guilty of the same crime, of adultery. You think you're righteous because you've not done these things on the outside, but you're not. Because you've done these things on the inside. He talks about marriage, and, and, and some in here might say, oh, good, I'm not divorced. Some are divorced, but, but some in here might say, okay, I've, I've never been divorced. I passed that one, really? Because Genesis 2.24, we talked about that in that sermon. The standard of righteousness is one man, one woman, one flesh for life. Have you always lived as one flesh with your spouse? And you say... 
Well, I've been, I've treated him like a separate flesh many times. Yeah, you haven't met that standard either, have you? He goes on to talk about keeping our word. Have you kept every promise you've made, every commitment you've made? You've never failed one time. That's the standard of righteousness. He talks about doing good to those who harm us. Have you ever exacted just a tiny bit of revenge, just a smart word back, just to put somebody in their place? Oh, you failed that one as well. He talks about loving our enemies. Have you really cared for your enemy? With the common grace, God cared for you as you were an enemy, as he blessed your life even before you were in Christ. We fail that one as well. He talks about righteous worship of God, that it's not to be tainted with any thoughts of what other individuals think. And how many times have you prayed when somebody else was hearing and you thought, I wonder what they think? You haven't met that standard either because your focus was not completely on God in those moments. And your worship is tainted and you don't meet that standard of righteousness either. He talked about dealing with material possessions and how often is your heart divided where I, I want the money, but I want to serve God, and I, I want both. And he says, no man can serve two masters. Any divided loyalty, you don't meet the righteous standard. Oh, and by the way, if you've ever been anxious about money because you didn't trust your father was providing enough, you have lacked faith in your heavenly father, and you do not meet the righteous standard. And we fall short on that one as well. In the last couple of weeks, we talked about judgment toward our brother. Have you ever been self-righteous? <laughs> Only every day. I mean, that one just pounded on us. And we've recognized if we have paid any attention that we have failed the standard of righteousness. That we haven't even come close to meeting the standard. That our righteousness does not, not only not surpass the scribes and the Pharisees, perhaps it doesn't even meet their standard, their lowered standard. And there's only one conclusion that we can come to is that, that I can't do it. And that's what he has led us to through all of this teaching, that I am unworthy. Now, there can be two responses to that in my mind. I mean, there could be more, I'm sure. But one might be, I'm going to do better then. From here on out, I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep the law. And if that is your response, I say to you this morning, you're breaking Matthew 7, 1 through 5. You are practicing self-righteousness. So you're breaking the last one he talked about just in that attitude, that I'm going to create my own righteousness. And by the way, even if you could, you can't, but even if you could obey from here on forward, what are you going to do with all the unrighteousness you've stacked up in the past? There's no hope. There's no hope. And that's the right reaction. The right reaction to what Jesus has been teaching us is, I have no righteousness. I have no righteousness of my own. I'm spiritually poor. I'm destitute of righteousness. That's where Jesus has led us to. That's where Jesus finds us with no spiritual benefit to be even found in me. That's where he finds us. And it leads us right back to Matthew chapter 5 at the beginning of the sermon. And the listener, the, 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 the discerning listener, the one who is really paying close attention will remember, because I know it's taken us 10 months to get through here, but Jesus <laughs> preached this in Maybe a shorter time than this preacher preaches on Sunday morning. I don't know. But, it, but they would have this still fresh in their mind where he opened his sermon. It may have been many months since we've been here, but let's go back and look at chapter 5, beginning of verse 3. Thinking about it from the standpoint of after he's taught these standards of righteousness, we read here, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he has just taught that I am poor in spirit and I think to myself, how is that a blessing? <laughs> and he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But you said my righteousness must surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees, and you just showed me it doesn't. I'm poor in spirit. How can the kingdom of heaven be mine? Blessed are those who mourn. I'm there. 
I mourn the fact that I can't enter the kingdom of heaven because my righteousness does not meet the standard he has laid out. But how can I be comforted? How can I become the blessed one who is comforted? Blessed are the lowly. Oh, yeah, the standard is way up there, and I could never even touch it, let alone get over it. I am lowly. God's standards are far too lofty for me. How can I inherit the earth? How can I become a blessed one who inherits the earth? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You brought me there, Jesus. I hunger and thirst because I need righteousness to enter the kingdom of heaven, and I find nothing in me. I don't have it. I hunger and I thirst for it because I want that kingdom. I want to be in your kingdom someday and now, and I hunger for it. But how can I be the blessed man who's satisfied? How can I be that one? He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I want the second half. I want to receive mercy. The problem is, is you've just demonstrated to me, I'm not merciful to my enemies. I'm not merciful to those who harm me. You've just clearly demonstrated I'm not, but I want the mercy. How can I be a blessed one? Blessed are the pure in heart. Oh, I'm a murderer and adulterer at heart. How can I see God? How can I become a blessed one? Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> I have not made peace. <laughs> How can I be called the son of God? Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. How can I be persecuted for righteousness when I don't have it? <laughs> for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's what I want. How can I have that? And Jesus now informs us in chapter 7, verse 7, this is how you move from where I find you and where you find now yourself to where you belong. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. The response to your spiritual poverty, to your lack, to your desire for righteousness, to your desire for the kingdom, for your desire for mercy, to the miserable state you find yourself in, in your mourning and in your lowliness, is to ask, is to seek, and is to knock. Ask for what? Ask for righteousness. What do you need? What do you hunger and thirst for? Righteousness. So ask. But Jesus, I don't meet the standard yet. Ask for that. Ask to be given righteousness as a gift. But I don't deserve that. I'm so poor in spirit. Ask. Ask. Seek. Seek for what? Well, in 633, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. I fall short. How can I get to the kingdom? I don't have the righteousness. And Jesus says, seek it. Search it out. Go look for it. Go find it. In 7, verses 13 and 14, just after our text this morning, he says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is narrow and the way is constricted that leads to life, and there are few who find it. But Jesus said, Seek, and you'll find it. Seek, and you will find it. He says, Knock. Knock on what? Knock on wood? No, that's not wood. Knock on what? That narrow gate. If you find the gate, you find it closed. <laughs> but he says, knock on it. Not that type of knock. That type of knock. The knock that my buddy Clint makes when he comes to your house. You know Clint's at the door. 
He, he doesn't want you to mistake that there's a tiny little knock. He wants everybody in the house to know, Clint's here, you know, and he, that's Clint when he knocks. You know it's Clint when he comes over. He's a great friend. Knock, and it'll be open to you. How does this all work? Verse 8, for everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. I want you to know that it's everyone who asks. Everyone. Everyone who asks in the way that he's calling us to ask, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone. There's no exclusion. Seek. Everyone who knocks, it will be opened. Everyone. There's no one excluded here this morning. If you ask, if you seek, if you knock, you will gain, he will give to you, he will guide you, and he will grant you entrance. He will do it. But I want you to understand, these verbs here are not a one-time ask. It's not a one-time seek. It's not a one-time knock. There is a persistence here, a persisting asking, a persistence in seeking, a persistence in knocking. It's not just a one and done. It is a persistence that only occurs when one understands that if God does not give, if God does not guide, if God does not grant access to me, then I have no hope anywhere else. I have no hope anywhere else. This is not a hedge your bets. I'll try Jesus for a little while. I'll try knocking and see what happens. This is not that. This is a persistence that if God does not answer, then I have nothing. That God must answer me or I have no hope. I have nothing else to lean upon. You ask like a man who needs a ransom for his dear loved one that he could never pay, begging for a rich man to help his loved one. You seek like a pilot on a plane with no fuel, looking for a safe place to land. You knock like a man who has a bear chasing him, knowing that if the door is not open, that bear will catch him and kill him and rip him to shreds. In fact, you could say you knock like hell is nipping at your heels, because it is. This is the act of the desperate. This is the act of the destitute. This is the act of the hopeless, who will not be satisfied until they get what they're asking for, who will not be satisfied until they get guidance in their seeking, who will not be satisfied until that door is open, until they're granted the access. They will never be satisfied until they gain it. Because they're desperate. And Jesus gives us this great news. He's already given it to us in verse 8, but he explains it a little more in verses 9 through 11. For what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him. I want you to note what Jesus calls you. Evil. Evil. I don't think that's just an additional thing. I, I believe that sometimes we can look at the standard of righteousness and say, well, I guess I don't meet it. We like to say things like, well, everyone falls short. Everyone sins. No, understand this. In our flesh, we are evil. Paul said, no good thing dwells in me. That is my flesh, he said. No good thing. I am 
evil at heart in the natural man. And Jesus says, you evil fathers, (laughs) your son comes to you and asks for bread, and you give him bread. Now, I might give my son a stone just for fun, but... (laughs) But I would give him bread if he was hungry. I think my son knows if he ran out of money and ran out of food, that he can come to mom. He comes for food when he hasn't run out of money or food. (laughs) But he knows that he can come to us for his needs. And we would gladly, gladly give the good gifts to our kids. We gladly do that. If he asks for a fish, you don't give him a snake. Again, maybe a rubber snake just for a little joke, right? But if they need nourishment... Evil fathers, for the most part. I know there are some men who have forsaken this type of thing in our world today, but the majority of evil fathers even still try to provide for their families, try to provide for their kids. Don't we? And I say we, because in our natural state, we are evil fathers. And yet we still provide for our children. And Jesus says, so how much more your heavenly Father will provide for his children. How much more you have not kept the standard. He not only keeps the standard, holds himself the standard, he made the standard. He is the standard. He does good to his enemies. How much more would he take care of you and give you good gifts? How much more More, how much better, how much greater is the Father in heaven than we are? (laughs) Oh, he, dear one, he is so much better. (laughs) There is not even a comparison to be made in my goodness versus his. Uh Uh-uh. I mean, call me evil, call him good, and that is not a big enough chasm to show the difference between me and him, the high and holy one the just and perfect one. God is so much more gracious than we are. And that's what Jesus is teaching here, that God is gracious. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, we have a parallel text here. And you'll see that as we read a section of Scripture. Luke chapter 11, we'll begin in verse 5. This is a very parallel text, but Jesus gives a little scenario here for us to consider prior to giving us what is in our text this morning. And I think when we cross-reference this text with the text we're in, it just sheds a little bit more light on it for us. And so Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 5. Then he said to them, Which of you has a friend and will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, so the door's closed, he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot rise up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not arise and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. But what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if his son asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This man has this friend who comes on a long journey. It would have been a crime almost, not literally, but a crime to not be able to provide bread for your friend who shows up at your door. Even if it was late at night, you, you needed to be a good host And so he goes to his buddy's house, his neighbor's house, his friend's house, probably like Clint. He says, hey, open up. I need some bread. 
I, I know you've got bread. I know you, you prepared for tomorrow. I need your bread. I was like, leave me alone. I'm sleeping. Well, I'm not sleeping now. I was sleeping. We're all tucked in in bed. I'm not getting up. And Jesus says, doesn't get up because he's his friend. Why does he get up? Because of his persistence. Now, some take that, and they make God out to be a man, the man in the bed saying, see, you need to persist to get what you want from God. So you need to keep asking and keep asking and keep asking to get money, to get whatever you're looking for for God to give. You've got to persist. It's all up to you to make things happen. Let me make this clear. God doesn't sleep, so he cannot be the man in bed. This is not about the man in the bed. This is about the man at the door. This is describing us, not God. In fact, Jesus contradicts exactly what he says. How much more? This friend of yours wouldn't get up because he's your friend, but how much more does your father love you? Who doesn't go to bed? Who doesn't sleep? How much more does he love you? That contradicts directly what some have taught on this text. But what Jesus is teaching is to persist, is he not? That you are to persist. Why does this man persist? Well, first of all, he's desperate. <laughs> he has no bread for his friend. He's desperate. He lacks what he needs. Second of all, he knows his friend has bread. That's why he's knocking on his door. Because you notice the man in bed didn't say, I got no bread. He just said, I'm not coming up to give you anything. I'm in bed. He didn't say, it's too late, I can't bake bread. He had bread. The reason he didn't get up was because he was in bed. And so the man is desperate. The man knows he's going to a man's house who has bread. And he hopes that his friend would be gracious to give it to him. And the friend isn't as gracious, but God is gracious. Why do we ask? Why do we seek? And why do we knock? Because we're desperate. Because we have need. We have great need. Why do we seek and why do we ask and why do we knock? Because God has what we need. Because God has what we need. God has the supply. <laughs> why do we seek and why do we ask and why do we knock? Because God is gracious to give it to us. That we persist out of our desperation. We persist out of God's supply. And we persist because God is gracious. That's why we persist. Because God knows how to give good gifts. So what are these good gifts that God gives? Well, in our cross-reference, we see Jesus use the same phrase, but here instead of give a good gift, he says, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. What's the good gift? It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. Now, we could think of the Holy Spirit, and we could think of the first time we became indwelt. We were given the Holy Spirit. Some of you may remember that time. Our, our kids that were baptized this morning professed of that time that they were given the Holy Spirit. They were made alive in Christ. And the Spirit came and indwell, comes and dwells in every believer. And along with the Spirit, you know what else comes? Access to the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness comes with the Holy Spirit. And so we ask and we seek and we knock for the Spirit for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven, that God might give us what we need. Friends, this is a gospel call. This is a gospel call by Jesus. He is primarily teaching disciples. We'll get there in a moment. But there is a crowd standing around in awe of his teaching, and he is calling them, saying, if you feel the destitute nature of where you are, if you understand now that you're not righteous, and if you say, I want this righteousness. I need this righteousness. He said, here's how you respond. Here's the invitation, if you will. It is to ask, it is to seek, and it is to knock. To ask God to give it to you. To ask God to give it to you. To seek after him. 
is to be, say to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful, like that publican, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I ask you this morning, in what or in whom are you trusting to access the kingdom of heaven? In what or in whom are you trusting? This is, listen closely. And you may say, I'm already a Christian pastor. Listen closely. Because if your hope rests on you at all, I'm 99% Christ, and I'm 1% me. You don't have Christ. You're outside of the faith. If your hope is in anything in you, he's just demonstrated to you, you've got nothing. Your hope must be in Christ and in Christ alone. So where is your hope? Is your hope in a prayer you said 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago? If that is where your hope is, you're outside of Christ today. Is your hope in a choice you made to follow Jesus sometime in the past? Then you are outside of the faith today because your hope is in something else. Do you point to your own asking, seeking, and knocking? Say, see, I ask, seek, and knock. That's where my hope is, because I ask, seek, and knock, so I have to go to heaven. If that's where your hope is, in your own asking, in your own seeking, in your own knocking, you are outside of the faith. Because it is only those who, are, who have their hope in Christ alone who are in the faith. And that's it. There are many who think they're in the faith who have their hope set on a little bit of me and a lot of Christ, and they're outside the faith. You ask, you seek, you knock, because you know if he does not act on my behalf, I'm out, because I am not righteous. There's nothing good in me. So where is your hope? Would you say, if Christ does not come to my aid, that there is no hope? That's the testimony of the Christian. If Christ were to choose, he wouldn't, and we'll get there in just a moment, but if Christ were to choose to say, Sean, I don't want you. I'll be damned. I'm going to hell. I got nothing else. There's, there's nothing else that I can depend on. It's Christ, and that's it. That must be our testimony. But I have good news for you. Jesus said this in John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. But I want you to hear the second part. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. If you come to him and you ask and you knock, you seek. Honestly, sincerely, out of a broken heart for your sinfulness and say, I, I need you to act on my behalf. I need you to save me. He says, not only will I receive you, I would never cast you out. I would never refuse you again. You can keep coming. You can keep asking. You can keep seeking. You can keep knocking. And I will continually guide you and give to you and open the gate to you constantly. For all of your days, I would never push you away. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you tired of trying to make it on your own? Strip yourself of self. Strip yourself of your works. <clears throat> Bear yourself before God. If you don't save me, God, I got nothing. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. It is in Christ and Christ alone. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. And the call is to seek the king of the kingdom. Seek him. Seek his righteousness. And he gives it. You don't earn it through your seeking. You don't earn it through your knocking. You don't earn it through your asking. He gives it to you graciously because he is a father that gives good to his children.
Now to believers, you say, great, I'm off the hook. This was to unbelievers today. Nope. Because the life of the believer, understand this, the life of the Christian is a life of asking, is a life of seeking, and a life of knocking. You weren't just dependent on Jesus the moment you got saved, if you're a Christian, if you did get saved. You are dependent on Jesus now. Right now. If you're a Christian, you are dependent on him now. You see, we, we recognize we were spiritual beggars then, and we go through this text again, and we say, I'm still a spiritual beggar. I'm still not able to manufacture to the standard. How about you? I can't. I have been beat up so many times studying this text in my office. I've shed tears over this text. As God has convicted me that I'm not what I ought to be. And I realize I'm still a beggar. <laughs> Have you come to that at different points through these sermons, through what Jesus has been teaching us, that you're still a beggar? You still aren't what he, you still aren't meeting the standard as a Christian. And what is the response of that one? The same. Ask. Seek. Knock. Do you think as his child, God wouldn't answer the plea to change? Before every sermon, what do I ask God to do? I ask him to change us. And notice, I don't ask him to change you. <laughs> I ask him to change us. <laughs> I'm in the us. And if you go to God and you say, I need change, do you think he would refuse that? I'm not going to change you. <laughs> he would delight to change you. Just as he did to make you a new creation, he's going to continue. We are the workmanship in Christ of God. He is working on us. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, but we are now his workmanship. And we ask, take off the rough edges, God. Help me see where I'm, where I'm missing the mark and what I should change. And we seek that out and we pound on the door and we say, God, open it up to me. Show me where I'm wrong. Help me to see it and help me to know my next step. And we ask and we ask and we seek. And you say, Pastor, I have been asking for him to help me with something in my life for, for years and it's still there. Then you keep asking and you keep seeking, and you keep knocking until he opens, because you can't be satisfied until he answers you. And I believe sometimes, because let me ask you this, could God, if you have a desire for some sin in your life, could God just remove it? Absolutely he could, he's God. And I believe sometimes that's a good gift to me, he has left me in a struggle for a season to make me depend on him more. Because the greatest need I have is to depend on God. It's to be fully dependent on him. And that's what Jesus is calling us to, to depend on him. That if God doesn't act, I have no hope. If God doesn't take this desire from me, I have no hope of getting rid of this desire. God help me. Now, no, he does not negate the asking. He doesn't negate the seeking. Seek him in his word. You can't say you're seeking and you leave your Bible sit on the shelf. You must seek. And the evidence that you're seeking is you're wearing out your Bible. You're finding out what do I need to know? What am I missing? Where am I doctrine or my theology? Am I off that I, that I do this without recourse in my life? What's going on in me? And I, God, open it up to me. Open your word to me. Knock on it. But you can't do that if you're just sitting saying, well, God's going to have to just change me. I know some people who struggle with various vices. <laughs> One friend of mine, he's in heaven now, so he's free. But he struggled till the day he died. But he told me one time, well, God's just going to have to remove this from me. No, ask, seek, and knock. 
That's our job, to persist. You say, but I've been failing. Persist. Persist. That's what the, this is a, this is the very definition of a believer as he continues to call upon the name of the Lord. Living a life of complete dependence on God that if God doesn't act on our behalf, we're hopeless. Let me say that is why I pray at the beginning of the sermon because if God does not act in the sermon, if God doesn't send forth his word, if just Pastor Sean sends forth this word, it will fail. But if God sends it forth, it will change you. It will do everything he sends it forth to do in your life and in mine. But he must work. Brothers and sisters, I have seen him work. I have seen him work in some of your lives. I've seen him work in my own life. I've seen him work in this church's life. Our God delights to answer those prayers. He delights to do so. He delights to give good gifts. And we need to understand that the Christian life is living a life in a constant state of need. We don't arrive here, church. We are always in need of more grace. Always in need of more grace. Are we not? As we continue to fail, as we continue to struggle, the Christian life is a constant state of complete dependency on God because we need Him to act. We need Him to work. This is... My friends, this is having a big God and a very small man, is it not? We have a big God. We are really insignificant. And all he does is say, just depend on me. Let me work by depending on me. Trust me, hope in me. Because we know that he and he alone can save us or sanctify us both from our helpless, hopeless state. And we know that he is gracious to give and to guide and to grant us access. Is he not? What a gracious God we have. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that, that you answered even, I'm sure, the prayer that was prayed at the beginning of this sermon to send forth your word and accomplish what you want to accomplish. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand that you will accomplish your will in our lives. But I pray that you would help us understand that whatever you're doing, our role is to simply persist and pursue after you and after Christ. We love you, but Father, more than that, we have grateful hearts that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.